recording started. Okay. Welcome, everybody. My name is Dr. Jackie Jacob, and I am one of two poultry specialists here at the University of Kentucky. Um, I deal mostly with small and backyard flocks and uh, the youth program. Um, as part of my appointment, I do the E extension, which is the electronic version of the cooperative extension service and uh, deals specifically with small and backyard flocks. So we do have a web page, which I will put up uh, at the end. Um, and we do have uh, webinars that we've been having for several years now. So there's lots of recordings. This one is being recorded and will be available for uh, later viewing as well. Um, and we have articles and all sorts of other things up there as well. Um, for those from outside of the United States, this uh, webinar series typically focuses in on the on United States, but uh, most of the things will be applicable uh, worldwide. So. Um, in addition to being the host, I am also the presenter today on guinea fowl. Once I start the PowerPoint presentation, I cannot see the, the chat box. I can see if a question pops up in the Q&A. So if you have a question, um, I'll try and keep an eye open for the Q&A box. Um, but probably the questions will have to wait to the end um, of the presentation when I have full access to the site again. As I say, once, I'm, once I start the PowerPoint, I can't see the chat box. So uh, here we go. Let's see, PowerPoint. I'm gonna share my PowerPoint and get it started. Okay, hopefully you can see the um, PowerPoint presentation. Um, if you are not seeing it, could you put it in the Q&A box? Because as I say, the Q&A box uh, does pop up, it's supposed to anyway, um, and allow me to, to see that. I'm not seeing any Q and A. Let's hope this is working because nobody can talk. Let me just get out of this. Go back to here. Whoops. Did it work? Okay, I see it. So that means it worked. So we. Whoops. I got two Q and A. So obviously, um, I can't make it bigger. All I can because it's lot. It is full for me. So it's your screen. Um, not mine, um, that's affecting that. So uh, share my screen um, with my PowerPoint and, oops, come on, start up. Okay, so for me, it's on full screen. So um, you'll have to, oh, I do see the Q&A pop up here, okay. Go on presenter view. No, I think this is, if you click from the beginning, it will show as full screen. It is full screen for me. So uh, hopefully it is for you guys, best I can do. So raising guinea fowl. And I did want to emphasize that this is more for small commercial or backyard flocks. I'm not talking the big, large guinea fowl production that you see in, um, in France, in Italy. Uh, so this is uh, specifically um, for people with, you know, smaller numbers of, um, of birds. So having said that, okay, guinea fowl is a, a term for many different species. Uh, gallinaceous, which just means that they are from the genus of gal, uh, gallinia. What is it? Um, anyway, so they are native to Africa, first discovered in the Guinea coast of West Africa, which is where they take their name. Uh, temperature and rainfall played an important role in their ecology and evolution, 
And this comes into play a little bit when we start talking about reproduction. Um, they are a ground nesting bird and wild ones are very strong flyers. As I said, there are multiple species that are considered guinea fowl. Uh, the black guinea fowl are all black with a bare head. They're men, mainly in Central Africa. They're not as popular with the, the backyard flocks here in the United States, but they are um, a, an interesting bird to raise. And of course they are very common in, in Africa. Um, another one that's similar to it is the white-breasted guinea fowl. It has a red head. It's red-headed with black tail and uh, white feathers on the chest. The vulturine guinea fowl is another species that's considered guinea fowl. You do see a few of these in some of the hatcheries uh, here in the United States, but they're not the most common. Uh, the crested guinea fowl is another one. The plumed guinea fowl from Central Africa is most closely related to the helmeted guinea fowl, which is the species that uh, predominates um, multiple species. Uh, that, sorry, I'm being distracted by the... It is in full presentation mode, so... Um, it's in full, as far as I know, it's in full presentation mode. Unless you're seeing that screen. I wonder if you're seeing that screen instead of this screen. Are you seeing the pitch, these uh, other slides along the side, or are you seeing the full presentation mode? That might be it. You might not be seeing, because um, uh, it's showing it on a different screen. Oh, we got here. I can't see the chat. All I can see is the Q and A. Okay, so you guys are seeing a different, um, let me stop sharing. You guys are seeing that screen instead of my presentation. I don't know why it's doing that. Come on, mouse, where are you? Share screen. Let's see if I do, if I do this first, get you going, and then come here and I share. Oh, that's not gonna work either. Why aren't you? Okay. Can you now see it as full presentation or uh, are you seeing it? Um, are you still seeing the thumbnails to the left because I've changed screens? Oops, much better. Okay, so that's working. Okay, so. Um, Thankfully, we got it sharing the right press, the right screen. I have three screens, so it's now sharing the right screen. Okay, so helmeted guinea fowl is the, the species that we mostly think about here in the United States when we think about guinea fowl. So uh, this is the one that I'm going to focus in on. Uh, there is very little research uh, and I've not got experience with um, the other species of guinea fowl. I've only ever worked with uh, the helmeted guinea fowl. Okay, keep working. Now we gotta get you to work. Okay, so the helmeted guinea fowl was domesticated three different times uh, by the ancient Egyptians in 1475 before Christ, the uh, Greeks in 400 and the Romans in 72 AD. It, those, sort of died out with those um, those rains, uh, but now it's you know come from Africa, gone on to Europe and has spread worldwide. Very popular for both meat and eggs. 
If you are into showing purebred, the American Poultry Association, which is the um, American uh, standard for uh, different varieties of purebreds, they recognize three. The pearl, which is the original color, also sometimes called pearl gray, the lavender and the white. The Australian standard um, has the, those three plus the cinnamon and the pied. But if you go to a, a website that are a hatchery online, you can find many different colors, brown, buff, coral blue, opaline, pied, porcelain, powdered blue, royal purple, white. Um, I haven't seen them for sale, but I have seen chocolate ones. I guess they would be called brown, but they called them chocolate. Um, so there are a variety of different colors out there. Most of the people that I know that are raising them backyard that have the multiple varieties do a lot of interbreeding between varieties and are probably developing all sorts of different colors within their flock. Uh, just some terminology, if you're reading any inf uh, um, information on uh, guinea fowl breeds and strains, strains is a breeding population. A land race strain is one developed by local agricultural methods. So the um, land race strains in the backyard flocks here in um, Kentucky may be different than Montana or New York and different than Ireland or anything else that's very uh, specific. And then there are the industrial strains. Um, there are breeding companies out of France, Belgium, and Italy who are developing strains specifically for uh, meat production. France is the one that is most notable in the exportation of their industrial strains for meat production. So some terminology, the species is guinea fowl. You often hear them referred to as guinea hens, but that's the females. So guinea pullets is the immature, guinea hen is the, the mature, guinea cockerels, guinea cocks, and then the um, the babies are simply called keats. And so if you hear people talking about keats, they're talking about um, baby guinea fowl. So one of the things that is um, unique about guinea fowl is that have that, well, it's not unique because there are cassowaries have them, but they have a helmet or a cask on the top of their head. Uh, the nostrils are covered with some material that's referred to as the sear. They have the two wattles on either side. They have the white uh, cap skin. And then of course you can see the ears are not as covered with the, um, the feathers like you would see in a chicken. Um, the shank is, is the leg portion without the feathers and the hawk is that joint between the end of the drumstick and the start of the shank. So, um, Guinea fowl are monochromatic, which means that they males and females look alike, uh, which makes it very difficult to distinguish, which we will get into when we get to uh, reproduction. One of the, the things that they, they have shown is that if you measure a population of females and a population of, ma of males, the males have a larger helmet, they have a lot larger sears, and they have larger wattles. But if you have a single bird, it can be very difficult to tell whether it is male or female because which is larger. You know, you have to have something to compare to tell one from the other. So some characteristics of the guinea fowl is that they have a very harsh cry. They're very easily agitated, which means that they will pile very easily. Um, and if they pile, they have very uh, sharp claws, they will scratch each other. So if you're raising them for meat, you can get damaged skin, which can result in uh, downgrades if you were getting it processed for meat. Um, they are, 
uh, less docile, of course, compared to other poultry species, but they are very sociable, but they do not like confinement. And confinement has been shown to reduce the fertility of males for a number. They haven't figured out whether that's physiological or psychological um, in, in the, you know, the stress of being confined versus um, just the confinement itself. So uh, guinea fowl can be housed with other poultry species. They tend to keep to themselves for the most part. And if you have enough roosts and, and uh, whatnot within the poultry house, they tend to occupy uh, other parts. The one problem that you do see though, is that there can be severe aggression between guinea fowl and roosters. This was a, um, a fight that broke out at a farm when I was there. Um, you can see that there can be a lot of territorial things going on. This, these birds were free ranging, but the, the rooster, and I'm assuming a, a guinea cock got into it. Um, they didn't like that they were in such proximity to each other. Um, so the main thing, uh, you have to decide when you're, uh, you know, before we can get into too many specifics is um, what is your purpose for raising the guinea fowls? So uh, in Europe, they're known as the Sunday bird. They also have names like Pintad, Fer Feraona, or African pheasant. You can see this, this is a Gramad Farms, which is, um, Actually, this is sold in the United States, but Grimaud Farms is the breeder and um, they have the Pintad on the end. It's a French company that raises it. And um, so uh, most of the meat type birds that are raised industrially here in the United States, and we don't have a lot of it, are from French breeding stock. Guinea fowl meat is white like chicken, but tastes similar to pheasant, but without the gamey flavor. They're a moist and meaty bird, and they're substantially leaner than the chicken, and they're best served braised or roasted. And I found this interesting that this was being sold online. It was a three and a half pound um, bird for $45, but this bird, uh, was also being sold online. And this is also sold in the United States at a 3.5 pound bird. And they were getting a dollar, $175 for a carcass. I don't know who pays that, but you know, if you can get that, you can make a lot of money pretty fast. Uh, compared to some of the other um, types of um, poultry that are out there. The four is the guinea fowl. So, you know, it's definitely smaller than the, the um, turkey, goose, and, and uh, duck, but bigger than some of the other game type birds. Uh, this was from some research that um, guy out of Tennessee did. He compared uh, the meat from a guinea hen, and I'm assuming that he was saying from the female, um, because he does have hens and drakes in the, the thing, and the Peking duck is a, actually a type of duck, not the Pekin duck, it's a, it's a dish, anyway. Um, so they were higher in protein and considerably lower in fat compared to chicken and turkey, um, and as well as the, the ducks. Muscovies are, of course, very uh, lean as well. Um, and then, you know, if you look at pork, veal, or beef, they're definitely um, lower. Oops, what happened here? Okay, so I missed something somewhere. But uh, production methods in uh, developing countries, um, a lot are based on uh, scavenging systems, complementing village chickens by utilizing spaces and feeds not accessible to chickens. But many countries are looking at commercial guinea fowl production. 
So most of the recent research that you will see online coming from Ghana, Czechoslovakia, um, Nigeria, they're looking at industrializing the production of guinea fowl, um, probably mostly for export or for the tourist trade, because a lot of them depend on tourist trade as a source of income. But I, there will always be chickens and guinea fowl at the village level. So, but they are, most of the recent research is coming from um, developing countries more so than United States. Oh, come on, why aren't you working? Okay, so in the developed countries, so commercial operations are very similar to broiler chickens. The pearl variety is been, that has been selected for meat production is one option, or the French strain, which was developed from the pearl variety is another. So they say that the pearl variety um, that has not been industrialized is got less fat in it. Um, you get that with the you know, broiler chickens, as well, you know, you get that industrialized uh, strain of meat chicken has more fat in it than the, the heritage type. Um, even if you get that heritage selected for meat production. So um, a lot of the research or the data uh, that has for production values can be either of those two strains. The French strain is going to develop faster with a better feed efficiency, but the pearl variety that has been selected for meat production, uh, which is what many of the hatcheries in the United States sell for meat production, um, is going to give a better quality carcass. For non-commercial, hobby, whatever you want to call them, um, you can go anywhere from confinement to semi-confinement to free range, and a lot depends on why you are raising them. That's what I'm missing. I had meat and then I missed everything else. So this is a free range production, commercial production in England, 25 acres. They've just recently gone into guinea fowl. They use mobile pens that they had that were originally developed for chickens. And he takes uh, 6.5 kilos of feed, which is about 7.7 .7 pounds to reach a two pound, two pound um, bird. I mean, that's very expensive. Um, they put them in the pens for the first four to five weeks and then they let them go outside um, and they make use of natural lighting. Okay, so something got out of order because here we are back to the purpose for raising them. Um, and I apologize for that, but uh, a lot of people want to go into um, guinea fowl for tick control. And um, the research shows that they are very efficient at eating ticks, adult ticks, but it's important to remember that if you're getting it to, con to prevent Lyme disease or Rocky Mountain fever, uh, which are tick-borne diseases, those diseases are carried by the nymph stage, not the adult stage, and the guinea fowl do not eat the nymph stages. So they haven't been shown to prevent the transmission of Lyme disease, but they have been shown to keep down the adult ticks. Of course, if you decrease the adult ticks, you decrease the eggs, which would in theory decrease the nymphs. But um, the research has shown that it's not been effective in preventing Lyme disease, does not reduce nymphs, but does they do reduce the adult population. Uh, so as a tick control method, because there are other types of ticks, not just the ones that carry Lyme disease, it's inexpensive and less environmentally damaging for adult tick control. Of course, they can be very noisy and trying to 
keep them in a particular area to control uh, the ticks can be difficult. So um, trying to train them to be in one area can be hard. Most of the research has required penning them up. So, and then the pens are moved and then the, the impact on the ticks, um, tick population is evaluated. And so I get the question all the time, what is the number of guinea fowl per acre that you would need to control ticks? Well, that depends on so many different things that you know it's hard to even know where to start to try and figure it out because it depends on one, the number of ticks, because the number that, you know, a guinea fowl can only eat so many ticks. So um, having enough for whatever the population is in your area, that's going to vary from location to location. And of course, they don't live on ticks alone. So what other forage material is available and or are you providing feed? And if you're trying to keep them in a particular area, you may need to give them the feed to keep them there. So um, it's impossible to come up with a number that's going to be applicable everywhere because, again, number of ticks, what else is there for them to eat? Uh, are you providing housing or are, are they just perching at night? What time of the year? the amount of ticks is going to vary from year to year, as is the amount of forage material that you get from year to year. So, um, you know, I get that question a lot, but it's, it's not one that can be easily answered. Uh, I've also heard it mentioned, you know, that you can use it to keep snakes down. Um, a single guinea fowl will not attack a snake. A flock of guinea fowl will attack a snake that comes into their territory. And there are pictures and videos online showing guinea fowl attacking snakes and um, other things that may come across their territory. So, but don't think that, you know, a pair of guinea fowl are going to control snakes. You need a large number if they're going to combat snakes. Um, guinea fowl, of course, lay eggs. If you're not hatching them out yourself, guinea fowl eggs can be used and sold as, as a table egg. And there are production types that are raised specifically for eggs. You need, if you want to raise guinea fowl for eggs, you need to get a strain that has been developed specifically for egg production. So you need one that you know the breeder has been actively selecting for egg production. Just like if you're getting one for meat, you need one where the breeder has been specifically um, selecting for meat production. So if we look at eggs, compare. Uh, production compared to chickens. Guinea fowl start later for egg production than chickens. So chickens can start anywhere from 16 to 24 weeks of age, depending on the breed, uh, whether you know it's a good strain for egg production or heritage type chicken. The, the um, guinea fowl anywhere from 28 up to you know 42 weeks, depending on the variety. So the pearl, which is the the um, the native color, so to speak, um, they they come in first. You know, at 28 weeks. Lavenders, 31 weeks. Blacks, 33. Whites, 42. So, depending on what variety you have and how well they have been selected for egg production, uh, is when they're going to come into production. And of course, it's going to be later than with chickens. They also produce fewer eggs than with chickens. So in an extensive system, not an extension system, extensive systems, you might get 60 to 90 eggs per hen per year. 
some of the intensive systems where they house them in cages, you may get 130 to 145 eggs. Again, it depends on the housing system, depends on the strain, depends on the nutrition, a uh, number of different factors. Um, but most of the research says that, you know, if you're raising them for egg production after 64 weeks, you know, they don't lay that much. And, you know, if they're only starting at 28 weeks, they're definitely not laying as much as uh, with, with chickens. Compared to chicken eggs, guinea fowl eggs are smaller, but the, the domestic guinea fowl eggs are larger than their wild counterparts. And the guinea fowl eggs are thicker and they have stronger shells than the um, chicken egg. Uh, other purposes that, um, that you might want to think about um, would be for feathers not necessarily as the sole purpose, but perhaps as a byproduct. Um, guinea fowl feathers can be sold for, you know, in, in the um, handicraft stores. So this one was being sold online for fly, fly tying, uh, 50 feathers for $7.50. Um, but I've seen, you know, I was looking online and you can see a lot of different types of artwork that are done with, um, you know, with guinea fowl feathers. The one on the bottom right is a, a brooch that you could put on. You get a little bit of a, a wall decoration and then that those feathers are inside the glass. And of course the fly fishing. Where aren't you working? Jason, I can't see your raised hand, but if you type it in the q and I can probably see it. I can't see the chat box. Um, another reason to raise guinea fowl is as guard animals. Uh, see, they attack snakes. They will attack most anything that walks into uh, their neighborhood. So um, they were great for letting the rest of the poultry flocks know. So this is a YouTube video on a guinea fowl attack. They'll attack anything that comes into their area. They will alert. Um, they will look at other. Whoops. They will look at. Oh shoot! Now what happened? Got to get back to my. Uh, okay. Um, they. You know, we used to have them on our farm and they would let you know of anything that might come that's not supposed to be there. So uh, if the neighbor's dog walked over or um, if there was an owl nearby or whatever, they would let the, you know, the entire farm know that they had to be on the lookout. So, um, in health considerations, the guinea fowl are often said to be resistant to many poultry diseases. And for the most part, they are, but they can be spreaders of many different diseases. So even though they don't get it, they can still spread it. So a good biosecurity program is a must even with guinea fowl. So for example, the avian influenza a low path avian influenza outbreak in Italy in 1999. Even the guinea fowl got affected by the low path. Low path means that you know it's not killing them. Um, you don't want to, you know, HP is high path. And so um, the virus that's involved in avian influenza can mutate very easily. We learned that with the coronavirus. It's the same thing with the avian influenza virus. And so even within the guinea fowl flocks, there were conversions from the low path to the high path uh, in those flocks. So even though the guinea fowl didn't show symptoms, 
they were spreading the disease. So you have to have care with those uh, in terms of biosecurity. Uh, Newcastle disease can also affect guinea fowl. It shows the same typical symptoms that you would see with chickens with the paralysis of the legs and wings, coughing, sneezing, white diarrhea, and the stoppage of egg production. And so if you are uh, in an endemic area like uh, Southern California and are vaccinating for Newcastle disease, vaccinate all the poultry, including the guinea fowl, because um, they can spread it, they can get it as well. They have uh, also been shown to be naturally infected with the mycoplasmas, so the mycoplasma synovia, the mycoplasma galiseptacum, which are problems in a lot of backyard flocks, are also uh, can naturally infect guinea fowl. So their symptoms may not be as severe as with chickens or turkeys, but they can get it and they can spread it. Uh, and France, which has the commercial, um, you know, large commercial guinea fowl operations, has been shown uh, for the last few years to get fulminating enteritis of an unknown origin. They're suspecting it to be a gamma coronavirus, but they haven't identified it yet. It's an uh, inflammation of the intestines, basically, uh, with a very high death rate. So luckily we haven't seen it here in the United States, but then we don't have the big broiler size farms of guinea fowl that they have in France. Uh, but on the good side, they if, appear to be, not be susceptible to infectious bronchitis, which a lot of the backyard flocks have been shown to have, give us that flu-like cough every once in a while. Excuse me, losing my voice. Um, <clears throat> guinea fowl can be affected by the same parasites as other poultry. So having a dust bathing area does help to control. They will dust bathe just like chickens. They get the same internal parasites as other poultry, the coccidiosis, the roundworms, sequel worms, hair worms or thread worms. It's the same, same uh, bug. And there's also been occurrences. There was a natural outbreak in Mississippi a while back with a guinea fowl that had Toxoplasma gondii, which is another coccidia type parasite um, and that can infect many species of warm blooded animals, including birds. Typically it is rare, but it does occur. So um, you have to watch out for that. Guinea fowl raised in confinement, um, bacterial infections can occur, the, the mycoplasmosis can occur, foul cholera can be a problem, uh, the you know, bacterial. Unfortunately, there is very limited choices for antibiotics to be used with guinea fowl. Um, there isn't a lot of research on the uptake and uh, you know, withdrawal times for guinea fowl. So if you needed to be treated here in the United States for most antibiotics, you would need a veterinarian prescription uh, to get an antibiotic to treat them. So it's very difficult in the first place and getting one that will give you a withdrawal on guinea fowl when the data is, is lacking can be hard. The fenbendazole that we do use for deworming uh, laying hens can also be used for guinea fowl. Uh, in terms of reproduction, although eggshells are thicker in guinea fowl than chickens, it doesn't appear to affect their hatching rates. Uh, it appears that the higher shell thickness is compensated for with a greater density of pores to allow for gas exchange during embryo development. But one of the things that they have seen is low egg fertility 
with confinement. So some of the breeders are seeing fertility rates as low as 60%. And so the big question then is why are the fertility rates so low? And one of the things is the sexing difficulties, which I'll get into in a minute, and also the narrow sex ratio required. So in the wild, guinea fowl are monogamous. That means one male, one female. Domesticated ones, one male for every four females tends to give good, rel good fertility. So while we think in chickens, you know, one chicken, one male can do, you know, 10 or 12 uh, females, that's not the case with guinea fowl. You need more males. They also have seasonality of breeding. And I mentioned the beginning that much of the ecology and evolution of guinea fowl was based on rainfall and um, temperature. So they have still maintained that seasonality of breeding. So although they've been domesticated, it's not to the same extent as with chickens. And genetically, they have found that sperm volume can be different depending on the variety. So for example, the white males tend to have a lower sperm volume compared to the pearl and lavender varieties. So the fertility depends on being able to identify your males and get the right ratio of males to females, having the right time of the season and having one with a good sperm volume. Uh, different poultry species tend to lay eggs at different times of the day. Uh, a lot of this is their interaction with light, but chickens most lay, lay eggs in the morning or early afternoon, rarely after 2 p.m., unless you got them on a lighting program that's going to do that. Turkeys mostly around midday, Coternix quail in the late afternoon, and domesticated guinea fowl have been shown that although they can lay any time between 6 a.m. and 8 p.m., the majority are laid in the evening between 3 and 8 p.m., which is a totally different time period than with the chickens. And you can see if you had them housed together, they wouldn't compete uh, as much for the nesting area if you only had one type. Day length. We have found that you know with chickens, we can manipulate their production year round by manipulating the number of hours of light per day. The guinea fowl do not appear to respond to increasing day length as a stimulation for sexual maturity. So you can't bring in guinea fowl any time of the year by simply increasing the day length. It doesn't work with them like it does with chickens. But studies have shown that the reproductive performance once they've started laying eggs can be enhanced by using the artificial supplemental light to increase the day length to 14 to 16 hours per day. So while adding supplemental light won't bring them into production, it will improve their performance once they are in production. Okay, so males and females, monomorphic, they look alike. Um, you, and they've also shown that vent sexing is not a good way of, um, se it's not uh, accurate for sexing uh, guinea fowl. The only sure way of sexing is the differences in the cry that they make. So at about six to eight weeks, the females start making sounds like buckwheat, buckwheat, or quack track, quack track. They have their specific sounds that are different from males. So the best I could, oh, I thought I had a link with sounds, sorry. Um, oh, here it is. So this one. This is the male alarm and signal call. So those are males making an alarm. And this is the call the females make. Okay, so all you can do to really tell the difference between the males and females is the sound. So you have to become experienced in, in understanding audio 
differences between them because the vent sexing and secondary sex characteristics do not help. If you've worked at all with chickens, you know that there are some sex link traits that have been used commercially. Uh, one of them is slow versus fast feathering. They have used it for sexing some broiler chicks. Um, it's a single pair of genes on on the you know on the two two chromosomes the the sex chromosome, and so. Uh, in order for it to work with guinea fowl, you would need a breeding population of males that was homozygous for that particular trait of fast feathering, not fat feathering, and a breeding population of slow feathering females. The um, occurrence of that particular gene within guinea fowl, you would have to be selecting for it in order to use it. So while it has potential, it is not currently being used because of the number of um, birds with it. So, but with the fe if you had the sex linked fast feathering, it has an 85% accuracy with day old keats, but that accuracy goes up to 94% at 10 days of age. It's the opposite with chickens. Chickens, it has a high accuracy at day old and it decreases as they get older. So it does work if you can develop a breeding population for that. I haven't seen anyone on uh, any of the, of the hatcheries that I've looked at that has used that sex link trait for trying to get a better sexing of the, um, the guinea fowl. So this is going. the male. Okay, in terms of incubation and hatching, incubation day is 20, about 28 days. Um, you shouldn't store eggs for more than seven days. Need to keep it down below 65 degrees Fahrenheit for that storage. You don't want to go too cold, though. You don't want to put hatching eggs in the um, refrigerator, you know, where you put your food. That's too cold. Um, but you don't want it really warm. Um, if you're doing natural incubation, a guinea hen or a surrogate hen, you can get chicken hens to hatch out guinea eggs. They can usually do about 12 to 15 eggs each. In artificial incubation is very similar to the chickens in terms of temperature and relative humidity. But remember that that shell is thicker. It's going to have a different effect on the hatchability uh, not the hatchability on the um, time to get out when they're ready to hatch. In terms of densities for housing, the pearl grays uh, for cages for egg production, you can see the densities there for the uh, French varieties on the floor. Um, Again, they're getting, I mean, that 13.6 birds per square meter is really jamming them in there. I wouldn't want to do that, but that's how they get those good feed efficiencies. Uh, and they still do it with only 6% mortality. So this is some uh, data that I pulled off of um, different people's reports. So the pearl gray, these are pullets for egg production. Um, so they start breeding them at 16 weeks, which remember I showed you that they're not going to really start laying until much later, but they're starting to get that maturity uh, starting around 16 weeks. Um, 18 birds per meter squared for those first eight weeks and then 12. Um, if you are, um, you know, I wouldn't want to be uh, raising keats in Wisconsin in the middle of the winter. Um, so I, I wouldn't start them then. If you're gonna have them free ranging in Wisconsin, you're gonna need protection for those bad days. Um, you can free range them, but I would have them come in and be locked up at night. One, it care, helps to protect from predators. Um, and in any of those days where the temperature just drops 
which it's been known to do. I know Mrs. Soda used to do that all the time. Um, it would just drop over, you know, within the day, just so you have to be careful about that. Um, they they can't control their body temperature as Keats, just like um, chickens. So until they're fully feathered, you need to provide them with that supplemental heat, just like you would chickens, chicks or, or poults, baby turkeys. Um, the French guinea fowl for meat, these ones were raising them up to 12 weeks of age to get a four pound bird. They had a feed conversion ratio of three to, to one. That means that takes three pounds of feed for every pound of gain. They had about a 7% a mortality and a 75% carcass yield. They had a good breast yield. Um, the same French guinea fowl raised to eight weeks by another company was getting a three pound bird. Um, with a you know 4.85 pounds of feed with a feed conversion of 1.6, so they're really cramming them in there, really getting them eating. Um, they had you know really good feed efficiency. 1.6 is pretty damn good. Um, chickens are doing that, so to get a guinea fowl to do that is pretty good. I don't think for a backyard flock that that's going to be feasible. Uh, but uh, some places can. So, okay, in terms of housing for small flocks, you can get them in confinement. Make sure that they have lots of roosting area, that they have the feed, um, lots of water. Poultry can't eat if they can't drink. So, make sure they have access to food and water. Um, if you're breeding them, make sure they have their nest boxes. Um, make sure there's good ventilation, keep it dry. If you want to free range them, so if, you know, having uh, a place for them to um, get out of the weather is important. Um, trees can be good for keeping away from predators if that's what your, your property has. They, you know, a lot of them will be more comfortable hanging around in the trees rather than in the poultry house. If you want them to stick to the poultry house uh, and you get them as keats, it's easier to, to train them to stay close to home. Uh, if you're getting older birds and you want to train them to stay home, because um, I remember time and time again, my dad would get guinea fowl, bring them home, put them in the chicken house, open the door in the morning and the neighbors got guinea fowl because that's where they went. <laughs> they didn't stay with us. So by keeping them confined for a period of time, maybe a couple of weeks, they get to learn this is home. And then you let one out and let that one go out and see if it stays close by, you know, if it's starting to stay close to the others, maybe let out a few more until they, you know they're gonna stick around, then you can let them out and keep your fingers crossed that they stay close to home. Um, you can clip wings you know, to keep them from flying away, but if you do that, then they're, they can't escape predators. So you need to, you know, the pros and cons of, of doing that. Okay, so in housing, the size depends on the desired level of production, what kind of production. You basically need to protect them from the weather, from predators, from injury, maybe from theft. You need to build on high, well-drained areas. You don't want them you know, in mud piles. Orient the windows to allow the sun to come in and dry the inside. Provide adequate space. Um, some of the ones that they're recommending for commercial production, I would not recommend for backyard flocks. Um, they say concrete floors make for easier cleaning. They're definitely not a must have, they're a luxury item. Um, if you're you know, free ranging, you might have something that's floorless 
and that you can move around just like you would do with free range uh, laying hands, someplace that they can get in out of the weather uh, if needed to be. Um, I say, we, did, we talked about that, feeding them at night to bring them indoors and of course the clipping. Okay, so as a summary, guinea fowl are great potential as a profitable enterprise, resistant to many diseases, but can still be asymptomatic carriers and spreaders of the disease. So you need to watch out for that. They are susceptible to all the same internal and external parasites. The fenbendazole, which is a flubendazole, is permitted as a dewormer here in the United States. I don't know about other countries. We have very limited pharmaceutical products available specifically for guinea fowl. Anything that's not labeled for guinea fowl would be off-label use, so you have to be careful about that. Um, although monogamous in the wild, one to four sex ratio gives relatively good fertility. You cannot manipulate onset of production, but you can uh, get improved performance. They can be housed with other poultry species, but aggression between guinea fowl and roosters is known to happen. So um, are there any questions? I went a little long. Uh, let's see. Doo -doo -doo -doo. That I don't have that going on. Might have to pay a visit with a dermatologist. Don't know what that was. Uh, thank you. Got to leave for a meeting. Okay. So I'm hopeful that we will have access to the recording. Yes, the recording will be up. Any suggestion for a hobbyist for protecting newly hatched birds from street cats? Uh, I assume that you're meaning letting them running around. Um, newly hatched chicks are, they're a ground nesting bird. So unless you lock them up, that's the only way you're gonna protect them from uh, any kind of predator until they're old enough to fly up into the trees. Um, so that's the only way to protect them when they're really young is to keep them locked up. I have lost two best layers to crows. Do guinea fowl harass aerial intruders as well as, yes. I have seen guinea fowl attack owls. Um, I've seen them attack a variety of different types of intruders. Anything that they see as a threat to their flock, uh, they will go after as if there's enough of them. I mean, one is not going to do it. Um, when, uh, what age to put outside in the house pen? Um, when they're fully feathered. So at least six to eight weeks, I would wait before you uh, start letting them outside, make sure they can still get back inside at night um, to keep warm and out of the weather. Um, but by six to eight weeks, they should definitely be able to go outside. Uh, if you're having them eating grass and other types of uh, um, forage, make sure they have grit available to help with the digestion. Are there any other questions? Can guineas be housed with ducks? Uh, ducks at waterfowl are always a problem because of the moisture involved. They tend to really get um, things wet. Um, but it, so it wouldn't be a problem for the guinea fowl because they would be up above the, the water for the most part. Um, they would inhabit different parts. Um, it's when you had the ducks and chickens together that you tend to have more of a problem. So um, I think you could probably do it if you had to, to have the guineas with the ducks. It's also always better to not mix species. We did do a webinar on multi-species um, poultry flocks, if you wanna go back for a recording. And I did say that I was gonna 
um, put this up there. Come on, mouse, where are you? So, um, uh, poultry extension.org has there's a link to the webinars. Um, I this is the last one that I've got planned so far. I'm waiting for the license to be sorted out with Zoom to be able to um, do more. Guinea fowl um, need a higher protein than chickens. Um, if you're using a meat type, it might work. Um, if you can get a guinea fowl, I mean, a game bird feed is better. Um, yes, they will eat veggies. They'll, um, if you give it to them close to your garden, though, they'll learn that the veggies come from the garden and they will eat in the garden. They'll dig up your garden. So you, <laughs> you need to watch out for that. Um, Facebook, whoops. Yeah, type today, facebook.com slash poultry extension is our Facebook page. Um, I guess if I wanted it to be linkable, um, whoops. It's got to go like that, right? Started with nine days old down to four. Oh, nine day olds down to four within 10 days, kept inside under 24 hour watch. They seem less hardy than chicks. Uh, typically, guinea fowl do better than chicks. Uh, if you get them off to a good start, you provide them with a good feed, you provide them uh, with, you know, fresh water all the time, can't eat if they don't drink. Um, they're usually all right. So um, I'm not sure what you were doing that, that caused the problem. Whoops. Uh, would you recommend leaving Keats with their mother or taking them inside? Um, if you're having a cat problem, you might need to bring them inside, but uh, it's always best if you can leave them with your mother, with the mother to take care of so that you don't have to, um, to worry about them. So I ring a bell when I feed mine since they were Keats and I found they come back when I ring the bell. Yes, you can, you can um, definitely, you can do the same thing with chickens. You can train them um, to respond to different things, uh, including ringing of a bell, um, something that they're going to hear from a distance will, will help. So um, yeah, that's a great idea, Michelle, for, for they start to associate the ringing of the bell with the, um, with the feed. So they come home and come back into the uh, poultry house in the evening. I'm not seeing any other questions. I contacted the shipper. They said that the rate of mortality was not unusual due to shipping stress. Oh, that's unfortunate. I guess it depends on how far you were um, shipping them um, and how many you got at one time. Yeah, nine is not a big number for shipping. So uh, all the same uh, external parasites, um, all that chickens get, uh, guinea fowl can get. Something about chick starter. Da, 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 da. Um, oh, I think, oh, no, that's not it. Something about chick starter. Not seeing anything about the crows, the cats, the recording. How many eggs guinea fowl in 365 days? They're not egg layers like, um, like chickens. So as I said in the presentation, you might get 60 to 90. 
uh, a year or if it's a one that has been selected for egg production, you might get up to maybe 140, but that they're not an egg producing like the leghorn. My guineas are eating the same feed as the chickens. It depends on what the feed is. Um, if it's layer feed and they're laying guineas, that's not a problem. If they are not laying guineas and they're eating layer feed, then um, it may be too much calcium. When you say the forage, do you have to worry about keeping them out of your garden? Yes, just like chickens, they'll dig up your garden and they will start picking at your vegetables and start eating. I, I, did, I just found your thing, Judith. Can they eat chick starter when they are keats? Should their starter be unmedicated? I would go with unmedicated um, and uh, you could use the chick starter. A game bird starter would be better um, to get them off to a better start if you can get it. But if you're feeding chicks at the same time, they probably could suffice. But a game bird starter would be better. Yes, uh, guinea fowl do molt just like chickens. Um, I feed Keats game bird starter, not chick starter. Uh, because of antibiotics. Uh, here in, in the United States, we don't put antibiotics in feed anymore. That requires a, um, a veterinary's prescription, except for bacitracin. I guess you could probably put bacitracin in there. Most medicated feeds have a coccidia stat in it um, rather than an antibiotic. So yeah, guinea keats can eat. I would go with unmedicated. Um, and if you know if you're feeding them chick starter, um, I say game starter is always better to start off with because they they um, need the higher protein. But um, you know I would switch right away if you you know if you've started at chick starter and you can get game starter, I'd switch over to. Oh, to game feed rather than game starter. Okay. Uh, probably around six to eight weeks, I would switch them over. So, uh, okay, it's 4.07. I'm going to stop the recording now. Um,